Well, it's been a freezing cold week out there. Um, that's why I'm still wearing my fleecy jacket. Uh, but here we are again with the next instalment of the Gladys Aylward story. Um, this this London girl um, who, when she was 19, do you remember at those in, in that Pentecostal revival, becomes a Christian um, and offers her life to God, feels that she is he is calling her out to China, turned down by the missionary societies, then saves up enough money all by herself uh, to head out to to China on the train. And she goes on that extraordinary journey, doesn't she? Um, out across Europe uh, to Siberia. Then she has that extraordinary walk in the snow with the woods and the wolves. Um, she's arrested by Russian officials. God really speaks to her, tells her not to be afraid because he's with her. And then she ends up on that Trans-Siberian Railway and goes right out, doesn't she, beyond China, ends up in Japan uh, where the Christians care for her and put her on a ship back towards China. And then she arrives in Tianjin in that city and the Christians gather around her. And do you remember, she sings, uh, she's never sung it before, praise my soul, the King of heaven, to his feet my tribute bring. And then she does that last part of the journey on the mule with Mr. Lu. And then she arrives out in, uh, in Yangchen in northern China and is greeted by Mrs. Jeannie Lawson, the woman who has prayed for a long time that God would send her a young person to help her. And she shares the vision uh, with Gladys that they want to set up, she wants to set up an inn and she wants these muleteers who go on these mule trains to come in and they want to feed them and they can give them the place uh, to stay at night. Um, and then they're going to speak, they want to tell them the story of Jesus. And Gladys said she heard Jeannie Lawson pray as though she was beating on the very door of heaven. Um, and so the muleteers began to come um, as, as Jeannie Lawson had prayed they would um, and she had asked that God would move among them and uh, Gladys Aylward had to go out and she had to call out, didn't she? No bugs, no fleas, good, 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 come, come, come. And do you remember it was bitterly cold out in northern China and so the, the men would sleep in the inn on these long, long stone platforms called Krangs, um, and they had fire underneath them and they were kept warm. I think actually it might have been quite cosy. Wouldn't mind spending a night on one of these, so long as I had a comfy mattress as well. And then the, the women would tell them stories um, after they'd eaten their food. Um, and sometimes Mr. Wang, who was the cook, would tell them stories. Um, and they would often be a bit inaccurate because he loved the story of Noah. So he'd often put Noah into the story that when Noah was with Moses and when Noah was with Jesus. And they had to keep telling him, no, you, you can't do that. You can't bring Noah into all these stories. These are true stories, Mr. Wang. And so the word got round about the... Um, ab about the inn and Gladys Elwood said she remembers watching the men leaning forward to hear every word that Jeannie Lawson said especially when she spoke about Jesus she spoke of him in heaven now among the angels and many of the men began to become Christians um, and because they were traveling they then spoke to others wherever they went um, of their new faith in Jesus um, it was an amazing time and during that time um, um, Gladys herself, amazing miracle really for her, she began to get the language. She'd been told you'll never get it. Um, and she began to speak it, speak it fluently. She began to read the Chinese Bible. Uh, God had helped her with this. And then do you remember, it's where we finished last week. Uh, there was a, t a twist in the road for Gladys because Jeannie Lawson, age 74, had a fall. Gladys nursed her in the inn over several weeks as she was dying there. Um, and before she died, she said to Gladys, God called you here in answer to my prayer. He'll provide for you. He will protect you. He will bless you. Carry on with the work. And then she died. And we showed you this picture, amazing picture of the day of the funeral in 1933 with Mrs. Lawson's coffin in the middle. And you see Gladys Aylward sitting on one side of it. And this is the, you can see there the Christians. This is the beginnings of the church out there. You can see the men at the back with their Bibles. These were men who'd recently become Christians. And probably Mr. Wang is the very old man sitting with the stick and the Bible. Um, but they had to bury Mrs. Lawson out there. And Gladys Aylward was now alone and she was quite alone um, there weren't other Europeans around she had no financial support and she had a kind of crisis now she thought well do I need to go back 
um, and she wasn't sure. Um, and she said, at that time, I prayed anxiously at that time, for the way ahead seemed full of difficulties. This was what she'd learned to do. She began to beat on that door of heaven. And sometimes when we're anxious, we think, well, I I'm not going to pray. But she'd learned when she was anxious, she needed to pray. And when she, she looked ahead and thought it's too difficult, she began to pray. And that's what we need to do. When we look ahead and we think, this is too difficult, we need to pray like she did. And some weeks later... The answer came, and it wasn't what she was expecting. There was a huge commotion outside the inn one day, and there was a lot of shouting. And what they discovered was that the Mandarin, the local governor, had appeared in his sedan chair. You can see a picture of it. His very important people were carried around by their servants, and he was being carried into the courtyard. And, and as he came in, Mr. Wang was shouting to Gladys, "'It's the Mandarin! It's the Mandarin! You bow! You bow!' And he called to her, she came down, and do you know, on that moment when he arrived, she was actually praying up in her room when she heard all of this. And the Mandarin was brought in in his sedan chair and he stepped out. He's wearing scarlet robes and he, he looks a very important man, not the kind of man you mess with. These Mandarins were very powerful local rulers. They were judges and governors. They had supreme power. People could live or die by their word. They had soldiers around them. Very powerful man. And he comes in and so, so Gladys bows down to him, shows him respect. And then he commiserates with her. He says, I'm so sorry to hear that Mrs Lawson has died he said but I've come here to ask you to be my foot inspector I want you to be my foot inspector he said I don't know if you know but there's been an imperial decree across the whole of China that the feet of the little girls and the women must be unbound and I don't know if Gladys had heard that decree, but she certainly knew about the binding of the girl's feet. And there's a picture here, slightly, slightly um, upsetting picture of how they used to bind their feet. And this was a, a custom of many centuries um, they'd been doing this. So the little girls from very tiny, they would put bandages around their feet and wrap them tight so the feet couldn't grow big and so that the toes went underneath. Um, and they and so it meant that the women, you can see the picture here, had tiny, tiny little feet. But the government had begun to realise this wasn't a good practice. And so he said, I want you to go out into every home um, and I want you to unbind the feet. I want you to go right out across the province, not just in Yangchen. I want you to go across the whole area um, and unbind the feet of the women and the girls. And I'm going to send my guards with you. And she said to him, I didn't come here to be the foot inspector and to work for you. I came to talk to the people about the gospel of Jesus. And he said to her, I don't mind what you talk about. You can talk about your God, he said, um, but I need you to do this for me. And then she realised that the Mandarin's request was the answer to her prayers. It meant she could stay in Yangchen. He offered her money and food for doing the job. It meant she could reach the women. At the moment, they were only reaching the men, but it meant now they could reach the women as well. She said after he had gone, I went up to my room and I fell on my knees in worship and thanksgiving. The way was clear. My place was here. God's plan for my life was unfolding before me. And so that she began to travel out to these villages. Sometimes she went for weeks at a time and they began to unbind the feet of the children. And she would, she would, they, the, the men would go into the village and they would gather uh, all, all the women together and they'd say the Mandarin's foot inspector is here. Um, and then she would come and she would unbind the little one's feet first and let them move their little toes for the first time. And then she would sometimes take off her own shoes and show them her feet. And they would say, whoa, your feet are so big. But actually, do you know, she only had size three feet in our sizes because she was such a, a little lady. Um, and the people began to gather. They began to come. Um, and as she traveled, she began to pray. She wrote at that time in her Bible, prayer is not an exercise. It is life itself. She was praying more than she'd ever done before. She prayed a lot when she was on that donkey, that, that mule, as she traveled around with those soldiers accompanying her. And everywhere she went, she spoke about Jesus and numbers of people began to be 
become Christians. She wrote in her diary, I had longed to go to China, but never in my wildest dreams had I imagined that God could overrule in such a way that I would be given entrance into every village home, to have authority to banish a cruel and horrible custom, and to have government protection and be paid to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ as I inspected feet. An extraordinary thing began to happen and churches began to grow up in those villages. She was busy now. The work back at the inn went on because the men had been trained up um, and the work in the villages continued and Gladys Aylward was really settling into China. She said at that time that she lived like the Chinese, dressed like them, ate like them, spoke like them. Sometimes she even said she thought like them. She wrote, this was my country now. These were my people. What an extraordinary thing for a young woman from North London to say. And so in 1936, four years after she arrived, she applied to become a Chinese citizen and she became a naturalised Chinese citizen. Amazing. But actually, there was still more to come and we're going to find out about that next week. Let's just quickly pray. God, we... Thank you again for this wonderful story. What an inspiring thing for us. What an amazing thing you did in the 1930s in northern China for Gladys Aylward. Lord, help us to learn to pray like she prayed, to pray when we're anxious, to pray when we can only see difficulties ahead, Lord. Would you teach us these things, Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs>